you know, now you can hear me. There you can hear. It was my fault, I was not turned on, and now you can hear. Wonderful. You can hear me now? Ein Shmiya Korea. Uh, do you hear yes, Vidalia? You hear me? All right, today we're going to learn. Am I being heard? Yes? All right, today we are learning the culmination of the uh, dra drama of Yitzchak wanting to bless his son, Esav. And um, we talked about this in the morning, in the Hasidut class, which you can see on YouTube, by the way. <clears throat> Why exactly, what his, his spiritual motivations were to want to bless Esav, why he thought he could make Esav do tshuva and etc. Talked about that in the morning. But now we're talking about the simple meaning, what it says in the simple pshat of the Torah, that Yitzchak, in fact, as holy as he was, he wanted to bless his evil son, Esav. And one of the answers that's given by the uh, Kliyakar we learned yesterday was that uh, it says that Yitzchok was blind, and he says he was blind spiritually also, that he didn't really see. Another explanation is that he, he had a, a, a command to give the firstborn. The firstborn had to get the biggest portion. So he wanted to bless Esav. <clears throat> and Rivka knew it was wrong because when she was pregnant, she went to find out what was going on in her womb, that there, there was all this fighting, and she discovered that uh, there were really two nations in her womb, and one was the greatest, the oldest, the greatest. They were twins, of course, and that he would be the servant for the smallest, Rav Yavod Sa'ir. The greatest would serve, so he, she understood that Asa was the greatest and that he would serve Yaakov, so she knew that what Yitzchak was going to do was wrong, but she didn't tell him why the Ramban explains. And... Okay, but now we're going to learn exactly what happened in, you know, after all these plans were made by Rivka and she put the garments of Esav on Yaakov, the garments instead of Nimrod, and she put furry arms, fur on in his arms so he would look hairy like Esav did, he would feel hairy like Esav did, and she made food, tasty food, just like Yitzchak told uh, Esav to go out and make. But interestingly enough, she did not tell Yaakov to change his voice. And that uh, immediately Yitzchak recognized it. <clears throat> and they say one of the reasons was is that she wanted, it, <clears throat> she wanted her husband to understand little by little that she was right. That really Yaakov should get the blessing. But let's, let's not jump the gun. Let's go. All right, let's start off with this cup Zion, right? Here's the beginning of this whole story. Oh. <clears throat> so what happens? So Yaakov goes, presents himself in front of his father. And he feels, his father feels his arm, says, well, this is Esav. And he says, interestingly, your, your, the, your hands are like the hands of Esav, but your voice is like the voice of Yaakov. And he says, are you sure that you're Esav? And he says, yes, I am. <clears throat> and Rashi says that he's saying, yeah, yes, I am Yaakov and Esav. Okay, so we'll see. Let's look at him. So Vayigash that Yaakov came close to his father, 
and he kissed him. And Yitzchak smelled the garments of his son Yaakov, the Yavorachay, when he blessed him. For Yomar, he said, I see the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that God blessed. Of course, what does he mean he can see? Of course, he cannot see. He was blind. So Rashi explains, let's see, what is, what is this field that God blessed? What is this field? It says the field is Vayarach, Rashi says, Rashi says, Vayarach en reach ra yoter misheta fa'izim. He smelled the garments. What were the garments? The garments were the skins of the goats that he slaughtered in order that his mother could make this meal. So he says there's no worse smell than skins, freshly skinned goats. The skins of freshly skinned goats. That came into the smell of Gan Eden. The smell of heaven. The smell of the field that God blessed. That it gave a good smell. This is what's called Hakal Sadat Tapuchim. Kabbalistic level. And this is also what the rabbis say. This is like the smell of the Shabbat comes in. So the, the, the evening meal is Shabbat. So the question is asked, how did Yitzchak know the smell of heaven? So the answer is, is that when Yitzchak, we, we just learned a sicha about this the other day, we just finished it. It's in Chelek Aleph, if you want to look at it on yourself. Of Lukuti Sichot. It says, when Yitzchak, when, when Abraham took Yitzchak to sacrifice him in the Akedah, so it says Yitzchak's soul and body went up to heaven for two years. And those two years were not counted in his life. And that answers a lot of questions about the, the years of his life and how it exactly it, it, it fits in together with uh, Abraham dying five years early <clears throat> so that he wouldn't see Esav, his grandson, go out to do evil. And if you make the calculation that doesn't work out the five years, there's two years somewhere left over. So he says those two years were the two years that Yitzhak, the father of Yaakov and Esav, the, he was up in heaven. So they were really born two years after, it says in the, uh, in the Torah. Yitzhak was really 62 years old, but he was only 60 years in the world. That's why it says he was 60 years when he gave birth. Anyway, from this we learn that Yitzhak was two years in heaven. And here we can see that it, he said, this is the smell that I smell, smelled. That's why he says, I can see. Because in heaven, there's no such thing as being blind or, or whatever. He realized, he remembered the revelation that was there. So when Yitzchak came in, it says heaven came in with him. We're going to see when Asaph came in, that hell came in with him. So let's have a look over here at the Malbima. The Malbim said, by Yishak, he kissed him. What does it mean he kissed him? That Yitzchak kissed Yaakov. This kissing is... This is the clinging of one spirit to another, which, as like it says in the Zohar, in order that there should come to him a blessing from above. Like it says, I said, I already wrote that these garments, they wasn't really that he smelled the garments. The garments were a terrible smell. It, is, it, it, these, it was skins of, uh, of uh, just freshly stripped goats but it's the garments this is a mashal this is something which surrounds his body this is a sign shall osher veinyani olam hazeh this is a sign this is just a sign for the richness and things in this world these garments yes these garments they the of this world they haven't got any smell, but it's something that's spiritual, of the soul, <clears throat> right? It's something the spiritual can't really get any pleasure from physical things in this world, but Yitzchak the father he felt that these garments they have a smell a spiritual smell, and by means of this Yasech Tzedakah Chesed, 
that by means of this, Yitz Yaakov will be driven to do kindness and he'll have time to learn Torah. He'll want to learn the Torah. That's what it says. I see the smell of the field. And the rabbis say that this is the, the, of the smell of tapuchim. What does it mean? He says the smell of etrogima. Like it says in the Tosfos, that in the, all of the trees of the, that there are in existence, the, 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 um, the shell of the, the, of, the, of the fruit is secondary to the, free, to the fruit. And it, the shell does not have a smell of its own. But an etrog, also the wood and the leaves, also have a good smell. And this is, what does it mean? That even the external things that Yaakov is going to do, the secondary things to the fruit, they'll also have a good spirit, spiritual smell. In other words, he, spiritual smell. So in other words, Yitzchak sensed that Yaakov's garments, in other words, even the odor of things that he does in this world, will have a good smell. And he'll bring spirituality even into this physical world. And so that's what it says, that that's why he began his blessings with the dew of the heaven and the, the fat of the earth or the oil of the earth. This is the smell of the field. This shows that he will be blessed with physical riches as well. Okay, good. Next. So in other words, Yaakov, Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go a little further here. So he said, okay, now I'm going to give you a blessing. I'm going to give you the blessing. Now Yitzchak is now blessing who he thinks is Esav. But he's got a sense that maybe he's making a mistake. But nevertheless, he's still blessing Esav. He smells his garments that smell beautiful. Who knows, maybe Esav did tshuva. So he says, God should give you from the dew of the heaven and from the fat of the earth, from the oil of the earth. Barov the gun and much grains, the tirosh, and wine. Okay, what does he say? Rashi, God says he should give and return and give. Yitin. Ve'yitain. Ve'yitain. He's just starting off. He's giving him the first blessing. It should say, yitain, he got you give. What does it mean? Ve'yitain. And he should give you. You don't start off a sentence, right? Just a, 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 by, by, and say, and. And means connected to something else. What does he mean? That he should have many blessings. A blessing and choser v'yitain. According to the simple meaning, this refers to what it says before, that, I, that he saw the smell of my, the sun, that God, of, of his child, and it was like a smell of the field that God blessed it. And now he says, and because I saw that you have this smell of the field, in other words, your garments are pure, so I know you have vessels to hold the blessing. It says, me tala shamayim, from the dew of the heaven. Like it says, that you get dew from heaven. The Midrash says, the, it says that there's a lot of different explanations about this. Or we can say like this. It says, What does it say? Elohim. The name, it doesn't use the name Yud Ke Vav Ke. It uses the name Elohim. Why? He said, because Elohim is with judgment. And there was, he was, in other words, he was telling Yaakov, if you are fit, then God will give it to you. But if not, then he won't give it to you. But to Esav, he said, you are going to get the fat of the earth. We'll see the blessing to Esav 
we'll see in a moment, right afterwards. <clears throat> right, because after Yitzchak finishes blessing Yaakov, so Yaakov leaves, and immediately afterwards comes in Esav, and he says, here, Father, I'm sorry it took a long time, but here's, and his father said, what is going on over here? I just gave the blessing to Yaakov. And Esav said, wow, he's tricked me. He took your blessing from you. And that's what's going to be. We'll see. Well, that's going to be the blessing that he says, Father, don't you have a little blessing for me? So he gave him a blessing. He says, <clears throat> by Esav, he said, He guaranteed him, not in the name Elohim, no judgment. You are going to get the fat of the earth, whether you're righteous or whether you're evil. God will give it to you. And from it, King Solomon learned when he made the base of Migdash, <clears throat> so he prayed to God the prayer for all the Jews, and he said, He said, God, I believe in whatever you do. I am not judging. Lo yikra alecha tagar, and therefore we're never going to say any judgment. It, God, the same way you didn't judge Esau, so we're not going to make any judgments about you. Therefore, that's for a Jew. In other words, for whatever reason, God, you decided you're going to judge the Jews, you're going to give to the Jews with judgment. But a non-Jew, a Nachri, Mechusar Amuna doesn't really have any belief in you. Therefore, Omar, Va'ata Tishma Shamayim, Rasita Kachal Asher Yikro Alecha, Hanachri, Ben Roy, Ben She'en Roy. Says to the non-Jews, you give without any counting. We see that the non the non Jews tremendous success. <clears throat> this is an old from comes comes from an old Rashi. They say that Rev Levi Yitzchak Radichev he said, God, please provide for the Jewish people, provide for the Jewish people like a Gentile. Give the Jewish people like the, like a Gentile, like a goy. So what do you mean? The same way a goyim they succeed, they're happy, they're this. They, they, they do all the sins, they're eating, they're, they're fat, they're good. they succeed. <clears throat> do it also with the Jews. What do you have to be so exacting with the Jews for? The Ramban says, <clears throat> this is not a blessing that God Elohim will give you from the dew of the heaven, because that's nature. Dew comes down anyway. If he would say it will give you a lot of or maybe it will come down only in its proper time, like Gishmechem Bitam, then that would be a blessing. <clears throat> but what is it? So, if so, what is the blessing? What is he saying? He's reminding him that the blessing is like this field that God blessed. And the reason that God blessed him is because Hashem blesses him in the field to say that you will be successful. You will be successful there. <clears throat> you won't die. And all of your and nothing bad will come. That's why it says The blessing, it means that you'll have an extra blessing from not just from rain, but also from dew. <clears throat> Even from the dew of the, of the heavens and the, earth, the fat of the earth you're going to have uh, plenty <clears throat> because it's going to come constantly from God, just like dew comes constantly. And it'll never stop forever. Therefore, it says, Elohim, <clears throat> Elohim, all of your days on the land, you'll have this dew. It, if you want it, if you want the blessing. But the Ace of he didn't give a gift from Hashem, and not in multitude, but he said, He said that from the back parts of Yitzchak, of Yitzchak you will be fed, you will be provided for. And me, Tal, only from the dew of the heaven will be your, you will be provided. He hinted at that what? that it's going to stop. But while he is receiving, he'll receive good. But he's saying, God is telling that Esau that it's not going to go this way forever. It'll, it has 
an end to it. Okay, now you have to remember that what's happening over here is the whole future of the world is depending on this. Now let's see the blessings that Asa gets. Asa now comes in and he says to his father, Father, haven't you got one blessing for me? It says, by the way, also right here, let's go a little, just a little bit back, that when he came in, and he came in and he said, and he took your blessing. That's what Yitzchak said to Abraham. We just learned to see about that. Why did it have to be in Mirma? So it says, one second, here we go. I'm sorry. Esav came in and said, Father, here I am. I'm sorry it took so much time. All the animals were running away from me, but here I brought it for you. Yitzchak heard this and he was shaken. He was shaken with a tremendous fear. And he said, If so, me, Efo, who? So who is the one that just brought me <clears throat> the, the, the hunted food and he brought it to me and I ate? And I gave him a blessing. The gam boruch yeah, and he will also remain blessed. He will remain blessed. Here it says, vayecharad like the targuma, and it says he was very. It says ra gehinom. When Asab, when 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 Yaakov came in, he saw heaven was open. So he, Yitzchak thought that he had blessed Asab, and he was very happy. He thought, well, maybe Asab has improved. And now he has the, he comes in with him. There's the smell of heaven. I see heaven. Now Asaph really came in, and he says he sees hell is opened up in front of him. He says, whoa, 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 what's going on over here? What does it mean? Lomer <clears throat> He said to himself, Shamishim Kama Devorim Divra Maski. He said, Efoye Po Mi Who Who is the person? If so, who just came in? I just gave him a blessing. <clears throat> and Gam and says he's and he and he should remain blessed. Shalotomar ilule sharima Yaakov Laviv lo natal the bracha. Says so that you shouldn't say that Yaakov he tricked his father. In other words, his father really intended to bless Esav, and Yaakov somehow or other stole his identity. Says so don't say so. Here we see that Yitzchak is seeing saying clearly that no. Yaakov is the one that really deserved the blessing. Lokach, therefore, he skin and he said he blessed with his own, with a full heart. He tricked me, and now I realize that I smell when you came in, hell came in with you. I and when the other one came in that I thought was you came in heaven. Now I realize that looks like I made a mistake. Looks like I made a mistake. Looks like he really does deserve. Now let's see what blessing he did get. Asa says, Oh, come on, father. You haven't got any more blessings, but there's a, there's a limit to the blessings that you can give. Come on, give me a little bit of a blessing also. So he says, okay. Vayan Yitzchak, his father, and he said, a <clears throat> love to him, to Esav. He nay behold, from the oil or from the fat of the earth will be your dwelling. Umital, and from the dew of the heavens, from above. Let's just finish the blessing. And you will live on your sword. And it will be your brother that you will serve. But if you rebel, and you cast off his yoke, on from your neck. So what's it mean? Al harbacha tichyeh on your sword, like bicharbacha, with your sword. Al harbacha, like it says also in Yecheskel, v'amaritam al harbachem. It means you live with your sword, by the sword, by the sword. V'ayak asher tered v'ashen tsar. A reed b'sichi means like I am moaning in my speech. 
In other words, Kishiyavru Yisrael, when the Jewish people, when they transgress the Torah, then you'll have an opening. You can open your mouth. Then you can complain that on the blessings that Yaakov stole. And then the Jewish people will not be able to rule over you. Right? And the time, listen, when they were in the time of the first temple, especially as the Jews were ru ruling. And if you read <clears throat> a little bit of Jewish history, let's have two minutes of Jewish history. The Jewish people were in the desert for 40 years when they got out of Egypt. When they got out of Egypt, they were ruling everybody. Egypt ruled the whole world and they were decimated by the Jews. Other nations tried to attack them when they were in the desert and the Jews decimated them. Right? They, 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 they won every time. Says that one time, except when the uh, Amalekites came. But in any case, the, the Jews always won. When they came into the land of Israel, they conquered the land of Israel. It took seven years to conquer and seven years to divide. They conquered it up. Then there was the time from the time they came into the land of Israel until the temple was built was 440 years. The, all that time, if you looked at the, the in, in Shoftim, Yoshua and Shoftim, it was the same story over and over again. That the Jewish people were ruling over their enemies, nobody could touch them. And then the Jewish people started serving all sorts of strange, bizarre idols that they had in those days, right? Which is, it says, is a tremendous Yitzhak, but nevertheless, when they did, then they would lose. All of a sudden, the non Jews would take over and they would cry out to God, and God would send them a shofet, a leader that would, uh, you know, like Gidon and Samson, and they'll come and there were, I think, 15 judges. And one after the other, it's 440 years. They were always ruling. As soon as the Jews decided to do tshuva, then they were always ruling. Then King Solomon built a temple. When he built a temple, it was wonderful. We we're ruling over the whole world. There was peace in the whole world. But as soon as the Jews started doing sins, <clears throat> then took a little bit of time, then things went bad and the first temple was destroyed and etc. But all the time the Jews were doing what they were supposed to, is it was good for the whole world. The whole world benefited. And as soon as the Jews started not doing what they're supposed to and not doing serving Hashem, then it was bad for them. And consequently, it was bad for the whole entire world as well. Okay, that is the lesson today from the blessings that Yitzchak gave to Yaakov and Esau. And we are living from that till this very Day. Now let us go to the Alter Rebbe Shohan Orach. Very good. We're learning the laws of sick healing on Shabbat. And we've actually made some very nice progress. We are now learning, I think, law membate, I think. Let's see this. No, we did this membase. We just do like 20 minutes of this and the 20 minutes of Mishnah. God willing. Actually, we did this also, but we can... Okay, let's do it. Okay, so we learned that there are all these... There are different levels of seriousness of, of a disease. What exactly is in danger over here? And the, the, the seriousness of the disease, and according to the level of seriousness of the disease or the wound that a person has, to that degree, Shabbat, the laws of Shabbat, can be ignored. Or even, let's say, in more, for, as far as that's concerned, those things necessary to heal a person, is there is no Shabbat. Right? If a person's life is at stake, then you can do anything. You know, you can do it. It's not Shabbat. It's like Sunday. <clears throat> so, or some people say, no, it's not exactly that way. It's not Hutra Shabbos. It's, it's just that um, 
nidcha Shabbos. The Shabbos is just pushed away for only those things that are necessary for the disease. Okay, and we that's what we say finally in the end. <laughs> that's if a person is life is in danger. What if a person's life is not in danger? Just a limb is in danger. So then it says that you can do things even from the Torah, but you have to do it with a change. You have to do it an unusual or ask a non-Jew. And what if a person has not got a limb in danger? He's not in danger of losing a leg or an arm or something. <clears throat> but he is just bedridden. He's so sick he's bedridden. Or he is a little bit less severe that his whole body hurts. He's like incapacitated. So a person like that, you can transgress things from the rabbis. Then what happens if a person has a minor pain? A minor pain. But it's enough that it neutralizes him a little bit. He says, well, sometimes then you can just tell a non-Jew to do something from the rabbis. What if a person is just has like a little headache and he can go, but it just really disturbs him, you know, but it's not really that bad, but it disturbs him. Can he take an aspirin? He said, generally speaking, not. You're not allowed to do, what about taking a massage? Huh? Massage. It says, if it's a matter, let's say your, your, your muscles are tight and you can't, you know, move, you're not supposed to take a massage on Shabbat. We'll talk about this in a moment. We'll talk about this. You're not supposed to do anything that looks like it's being done for healing unless you are bedridden or you're completely incapacitated. Here, let's take a, a, an example. Any type of food which healthy people eat, it's permissible to eat them and drink them for healing on Shabbat. Even though that it might cause other problems. And usually people don't eat it. And you can see a little bit that he's intending to heal himself. Now, you're not supposed to do things on Shabbat unless you're sufficiently sick. But if you just have, let's say, a minor pain or muscle pain or something like that, you're not supposed to do anything that even indicates that you're doing, taking a medicine or doing a treatment for healing. But if it's a thing that usually healthy people eat it in the middle of the week, then that's okay. Even though that usually healthy people don't eat it because it has bad side effects. For instance, tachol, I think that's spleen. It says that eating spleen is bad for your stomach, but it's good for your teeth. A toothache, eat spleen. I've never done it. But a lot of these things don't exactly, uh, are, are, have not, are not in use today. Or karshinin. Karshinin is something like leeks. That these are bad for your teeth, but these are good. They're very good and they heal the stomach. So can you eat them? It's for a healing, right? And it sort of indicates that you're eating for healing because you know, it's bad for something else. Nevertheless, because healthy people do eat these things sometimes and they eat them even not for healing, then it's okay to eat them even if you are intending for healing. Right? So let's say to, to swallow a raw egg, to eat a piece of, uh, of garlic, raw garlic together with your food. Some people eat it. Some people do that. So I, you're doing it in order, you're eating the garlic in order to, to take down your fever or something, right? You, have a, a, you feel weak. So you, or you're eating the, because you have a sore throat. So you're drinking, the, because some people do drink raw eggs. They do it. Okay, let's see if that's an example. But if there's something that no healthy people ever eat it, it's forbidden to eat it or drink it for healing. Why? Why not? He wants to eat uh, garlic or something like that. I, he happens to live in Chicago. None of the Jewish community over there eats garlic or... But he wants to eat it. What, what does he care? He came from a place where they once in a while, he saw his grandfather do it once. No, he can't do it. If you're doing it to heal, to make, you have a sore throat, you have a this, you, that's why you're eating the raw egg, you can't do it. It's a gazer, it's a decree because of shechichat simanim because of grinding up 
ingredients, spices to make um, <clears throat> to make uh, medicine. The who grinding us? Okay, now n- nobody grinds up spices today. Anybody? But I remember my father was a my a blessed memory. My father, he was a pharmacist, and it used to be the sign of a pharmacy. Maybe it still is today. I don't know. It used to be the sign of it was a mortar and a pestle. Huh, you ever seen that before? I think it still is. Maybe mortar and a pestle. Mortar and a pestle is the it was like sort of a, a bullet shaped uh, stick that it was made from <clears throat> from uh, hard marble or something. And then there was a cup. It was a cup, which is usually thick and it also was made of marble. And they would, and it was not porous at all, it was very hard. And they would put the spices, not spices, medicines in there, whatever, and they would grind it up. I remember my father would grind it up and he would measure it. He would make his own capsules. This was, you know, 50, 60 years ago, but he would do it. It was a very common thing that they would, gr- uh, pharmacists would grind up on their own Okay, now some people say that this decree does not exist anymore. These things you have to go and ask a rabbi. You have to ask a practicing rabbi if this decree of maybe you'll come to grind up spices, it still exists now. But generally speaking, it does. It does. That you're not allowed to do anything for healing, right? Just for healing, and to a person that hasn't got a major problem he's not bedridden or his whole or he's not incapacitated you're not supposed to do anything for healing because it's a gazera maybe you will come to grind up uh, spices to make a, a, a medicine this is talking about what type of a person would do this is a person what person should not do it should not uh, drink or eat foods that people don't eat or drink and you're doing it only for healing. This is if you have a michush palma. You have some sort of a pain, a headache, a toothache, a minor or something. But nevertheless, you can go like a healthy person. Even though that it hurts him very much. But nevertheless, you can't do anything. So according to this, if you have like a minor headache or something, you cannot take an aspirin. You cannot take an aspirin. Normal people don't eat aspirin. And you can't even take any food that normal people don't eat and you take that in order to, to bring down the fever. To bring down the fever. But if a person's entire body is sick, he's like incapacitated, even though he's, chazek, even though he's walking like a normal person, he can force himself. And it goes without saying, if a person falls, is bedridden, you already explained that it's okay. You can do healings. But if a person doesn't have any pain at all, and he's not intending for healing, he just wants it, what? For another reason. For instance, ochel srofim, metukim. He's eating uh, some sort of a sweet, whatever it is, sweet roots or something. Or uh, a, like a, a gum. Srofim is like, a, what are they called? Uh, uh, they come sap. Sap that comes from a tree. He eats sweet sap from a tree, like maple sap, syrup. Or he swallows an egg, a raw egg in order to make his voice better, right? So healthy people usually don't do this, but he's, and right, it's usually people would do it for to only a sick person. But if a person is really healthy and he's not doing it for healing, he's just doing it for some other reason. He wants to have a, a smoother voice, then it's okay. Oh, because Ms. Kavin, but if you're intending to heal yourself, let's say you have a sore throat, you want to eat this egg or whatever, then it's forbidden. Even though that a person is really in fact healthy, is going, but, and he hasn't got any problem, but he's doing it for health. And from here comes a bit of a problem if you can take vitamins on Shabbos. If you're allowed to take vitamins, I'm saying, like I'm saying, I'm not going to make any decisions over here. You have to ask your rabbi, but are you able, are you allowed to take vitamins on Shabbos, which are only there to improve your health? This is for health, refuah. Or maybe it only means that you shouldn't get sick. Anyway, it's a question to ask. If you're allowed to take vitamins on Shabbos. Some people say absolutely no problem. It's just like regular food. And some people say it's not so simple. Because it looks like you're healing. So in other words, what was the question we were left with? Taking vitamins in order to give you health. Are you allowed to do that? 
on Shabbat if you're not sick at all? Are you allowed to? Okay. Next law. Um, you cannot make apiktuzin. What is apiktuzin? A, a purgative. Pur purgative is a purgative. Purgative. Something that makes you throw up. Hainu gorma ki. It makes you throw up. Shalol unnecessary. Shalol letzorach rafua. And those, even if you're not doing it for healing, you should not do it. And really, you shouldn't even do it in the weekday to take a, something to make you throw up. Why? Mishum hefsed ochel. A person has he ate too much. He finishes the meal. He ate too much. Says, don't do anything to cause yourself to throw up. Shemitokach, because of this, you're going to be hungry again and you're going to go back and eat. It says that the Romans used to do this. They used to make big feasts and then they would you know, enjoy the food and really like it and they get all drunk or whatever it is. And then they would go out to a special room and they would take something or would put their finger in their throat or something and they would throw up and then they would, you know, wash their mouth out, come back and start the meal over again, right? Start over again to get a, a, a pleasure. The im mitzdar marov, but what if a person ate too much, even in the weekday, then it's permissible to do it even with the medicine. But on Shabbos, you can, let's say you overate on Shabbat and your stomach hurts, and you should you want to throw up the food? Well, you can make yourself regurgitate, but not with medicine. Because it looks like you are healing and you're not allowed to use medicines on Shabbat if you don't really need it. But you can put your finger in your throat until a person vomits. It should never happen to us. What if a person has a pain on his stomach? He has a pain in his intestines, a pain. Muta, it's permissible to put a cup over it. Sheiru mimenu chamim. In other words, you take a cup, fill it up with hot water, pour out the hot water, and put the cup over your stomach. Even though that there still is uh, you say evaporation. It still is, uh, it's got the, um, um, the hot steam in the cup. And it's also permissible, here's something very strange, to lift a person's ears. What does it mean? ozim. Somehow or other, the sinews that are connected to the ear, that sometimes they fall, and mitparkim alechayayim, and the Jaw can fall. If anybody knows what this is, I would appreciate you telling me. I've never seen such a thing. But it says you can lift them up, whether by hand or even use a vessel. And also, somehow or other, it affects the jaw. Maybe his jaw becomes dislocated, could be. And also, to, <clears throat> it says to lift up the unkli. What's unkli? Tanuch shekeneged alev shenichfaf letzad panim. That sometimes, I guess, under the sternum, it turns in. I don't know. Every one of these things, you don't have to do it with any spices or medicines so that we should have the worry that maybe, in other words, he's just manipulating the body. And sarmium. We're going to learn about what happens if a limb becomes dislocated. Also, a person that gets drunk that the way that some, they used to have a, a healing, you can try it sometimes if you ever get drunk. I never have, and I've never been, been, been that drunk. Anyway, so you can try, what was the healing? What did they do? A person gets overly drunk, says they rubbed in his palms of his hands and his feet, oil and salt. <clears throat> okay, oil and salt, does that look like it's healing? In other words, it's, it's a, a manipulation that's done for healing. A person gets drunk and he feels really bad. So it says it's permissible to rub oil and salt into the palms of his hands and his feet. That was the healing that was accepted at that time. But what's the point? The point is that you're doing something that looks like you're healing. You can still do it for the same reason. Why? Because it, there's no, the reason that you're not allowed to do anything that looks like healing on Shabbat for a person that doesn't really need it, that isn't bedridden or that's totally incapacitated, the reason you can't do it is because there's this decree of the rabbis that maybe you'll grind up 
ingredients, you'll grind them up in order to make medicine. And in these things, these are just physical manipulations and therefore it's not a, uh, you're just rubbing in oil or something that there's no decree because of that. You can't learn from this rubbing in oil and salt in the palms of the hands and the feet that you know, it'll bring you to a heter to do uh, gr grind up spices. <clears throat> but, but, but even though this is permissible, we cannot imply that it's okay to do on Shabbat, which they do in certain countries, that they put in the nose uh, ashes from a tree, from a, 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 um, a herb that is ground up in order to take away drunkenness. <clears throat> so that, that you can't do because this ashes, what it, it, this is like taking a medicine. So therefore, there is relevant the decree of grinding up spices, which is the, the basic decree for all unnecessary healings on Shabbat, right? if it's relevant in some way. So if you're using some sort of a medicine on Shabbat, and that would, that's the treatment, you can't use it unless a person is totally incapacitated or he has a pain that incapacitates his body or he's bedridden or worse. But if it's not that degree, then you're not allowed to use anything sort of spices or uh, <clears throat> or powders or anything. All right, it is forbidden to shafshef et aguf. It's forbidden to massage a person, even for pleasure, like it says in Simon Shin Kav Zayin. And it goes without saying that you can't is, 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 massage someone in order that that person should start to sweat. Because then it really looks like you're doing for a healing. And also it's forbidden for a person to make himself to do something that will wear him out in order that he'll sweat for a four. So in other words, you're not allowed to, to do a massage on someone else because it's healing him. But if you do a massage, especially so that this person will sweat or that you will sweat because you're doing the massage, that's forbidden. And also, let's say you want to run around and just make yourself sweat, right? On Shabbos for exercise, you want to go for a nice run. Don't do it. Why? Because the same decree as we had before, they say if a person can do such a thing like this as make himself sweat, then maybe he'll think it's okay to take some sort of a pill or an ointment or a drink or something that makes him sweat. And it's also forbidden to press on the stomach of a child in order that he should defecate. Why? Because maybe he'll think that maybe you can give him a laxative also. So therefore you can't do it. Interesting. This is the last chapter and then we'll do a Mishnah. You are allowed to wash in order to heal yourself. In the waters of Grar, in this place called Hamtan, and in Taveria. Hot waters, natural springs. And also in pure water, clear water in the Mediterranean Sea. Or the big sea, the big sea, it could be the Atlantic Ocean. Even though that these waters are salty. And there was these, all these waters have minerals in them and sulfur in them and salt in them. It's permissible. Why? Because this is the way, it is a way to wash in them, even not for healing, just for pleasure. And it's not recognizable the person is doing it for healing, but you cannot wash in smelly water from the ocean or in water that has been used to soak things in it, which are disgusting. Why? Because no one ever washes in them unless it's for some sort of a medicinal purpose. 
And what are we talking about? If you wait, delay in these waters, you sit in the waters for a while, then it's forbidden. But if you just go in for a moment, even in these smelly waters that no healthy people don't go into, then it doesn't look like he's doing it for healing. It looks like he's doing it to cool off. Now we have to remember that uh, air conditioning, right, only started, I don't know, 70 years ago. When did they have air conditioning? You know, maybe less. You know, 70 years ago. So before that, I mean, the world is, you know, 5,700 years old. And the Torah was given 3,300 years. So for 3,000, let's say, 200 years at least, right? We didn't have air conditioners. When it got hot, it was hot. What did people do? They would go into water. If it got unbearably hot, there's some days that are unbearably hot, they would go into water. And sometimes it didn't make any difference to them if it was cold water, if it was dirty water or not. In a place where people, but it says that, the, but to go briefly into the waters of Tiveria and things like that, the, the sulfur waters of Tiveria, that's, that's permissible. But in places where people do not go into the waters of Tiveria or similar natural springs, they only go for healing, it's forbidden to go into them on Shabbos if you want to heal yourself, even if you're not waiting in them. If you want to go in for pleasure, you can go in, but not for... So in other words, if you want to go in for healing, for healing, you want to go into these natural springs or whatever, then you can, as long as you don't stay in it for a long time. You can stay in. It doesn't look like you're healing. But if it's nature of people to go in to these rivers, these places, and stay for a while, then you can also do it. That's if it's that's the nature of people. But if people never go in there, then you cannot, if no one goes into these natural springs uh, for any other reason except for healing, then you can't go in. You can't go in on Shabbat, even for a moment, even for a short amount of time. Last law, and then we'll. Ein rochtzim b'mayim amishtalshlim. You are not allowed to wash to immerse yourself in waters that bring about. Uh, how do you say? Make a person go to the bathroom. That bring about. How do they call it? Incontinence. I don't know. That's what it's called. Yeah. Oh, 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 one second. Yeah, read them and we learn. You're not allowed to wash in waters that bring about like a laxative waters. And also not in like teat. Um, uh, what is teat? Teat is like mud. And that, that some people sink themselves into. And no, you're not allowed to drink liquids that are like laxatives. Even if it's a normal healthy food for healthy people, you can't do it. People don't, licorice, whatever is licorice water or something that makes people go to the bathroom, prune water. You can't drink it and you can't drink it for healing at all, for sure. Why? Because all these things, a laxative, it makes you go to the bathroom. This makes a person uncomfortable. And Shabbos is supposed to be for pleasure. So therefore it's not good to take laxatives on Shabbat. We learned if a person overeats or something like that, then that might be different if he has pain. But just generally to take laxatives, there's some people that really go overboard. And they, take, uh, they want to clean themselves out or something. You're not allowed to take a laxative on Shabbos because it's supposed to be pleasant and this takes away the pleasure of the Shabbat. And this will do, God willing, no, 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 sorry, what? Wrong way, wrong Direction. Here. Lo chashim al nakashim vakrovim b'shvil shelo yaziku. That if a snake or a scorpion comes, there's sometimes there's secret words that you can say to keep them away. Even though that they're not running after him, and don't but don't worry about it. This is not called hunting because. Even if it was, you're not trying to capture these snakes or whatever. 
or scorpions, you're just trying to keep them away from you. So it's not called doing an action of hunting. It's regularly, you don't want the snake. It's what's called a malacha she'enu tzorecha legufa, an adid on Shabbat, which is not necessary for the outcome. And this is permissible on Shabbat, according to some people totally. As we'll talk about God willing next week. And now, the Mishnah. Little bit of a Mishnah on. One second. Yes. Oh. One second. I just have to find the link over here. The link to get into the Zoom from my. Here it is. Here we go. Ready? Mishnah Zion. Makot. The laws of lashes. The, the Mishnah is about getting lashed. Up to now, we really haven't learned that much about getting lashed. We learned about Edim Zomamim. And now we're learning about the city of refuge. We'll learn about lashes also. Okay, so we talked about the cities of refuge. That there are three inside of Israel, three outside of Israel. That the land of Israel is divided into three uh, equal sections. And that the, each one of these has, uh, has its own city of refuge for a person to run to. And that there's three types of people that run to the city of refuge. Anyone who murders accidentally goes to the city of refuge. And there's three levels of accident. There's accident, which is close to Mazid. That person is taken out and put into the hands of the, the Goal Adam. I think that's where, this is where we are. Yeah, here we are. He's put into the hands of the Goal Adam to the revenger, the revenger. And he can be killed by the family member. Then there's people who are totally innocent. They killed by totally nothing, no fault of their own. Those people are released. And then there's people who they're in the middle. They, they killed by accident. A slight amount of negligence, but not too much negligence. You know, they could have avoided it. And those people, they have to live in the city of refuge until the coin guttel passes away. So, but, but let's, that's the next mission. Let's do this mission. Rabbi Yosef Bar Yehuda, Rabbi Yosef Bar Yehuda says, Rabbi Yosef Bar Yehuda says, in the beginning, whether a person that was act, killed accidentally, killed someone accidentally, or he killed someone purposely, he would run to a city of refuge. And the based in would then bring him out and all this time, right, the goal Adam, the revengers, some relatives of the, of the victim, can, if they catch him outside of the city of refuge, they can kill him. So he has to stay there. And then they bring a whole guard, an armed guard, and, guard, and they take him out to be judged. Mishin is Chayav Misa, the base Dan, those people who murdered the accidentally was close to purpose, then they get killed. What do I mean? They get put into the hands of the Avenger, Avenger. Shalom right. Nitchayev Misa, those people who are not guilty at all, then they send them home. And Misha Nitchayev Golos, but the people who are in the middle, then they have to go back to the city of refuge. Like it says, Heshiv Otoa Eda, El Irmik Lato, etc. Okay, he has to stay there until the Kohen Gadol dies. What is this Kohen Guttel? So there's different levels of Kohen Guttel, so to speak. 
There's a coin gadol which is called Meshuach B'Shemen. That was mostly in the first temple, up, up to Yeshaya, up to the king. The, he's anointed with oil. Then Merubah Begadim says they weren't anointed with the regular oil, but they had all the garments. That's mostly in the second temple. Kohen, Kohen Gadol. Echad Sha'avar Mimishchato, or a Kohen that for whatever reason he was disqualified, and then he came back to be qualified again. Any one of these people, if they die, then the murderer, the accidental murderer, he's freed. He's set free. Anyway, so it doesn't have to be only the one Kohen Gadol like in the first temple. It can be a Kohen Gadol even in the second temple. And it can be a Kohen Gadol that was temporarily removed and that he came back again. Rabbi Yehuda says, I want to throw in another Kohen Gadol, so to speak, Meshuach Milchama. If the Meshuach Milchama dies, then the accidental murderer can go home. Who is the Meshuach Milchama? Meshuach says that before the Jews went out to battle, that one Kohen would be picked to, to give a, a speech to the, to the soldiers and to bless them before they leave. Right? Shema Yisrael, listen, Jews going out, God is fighting with you, don't be afraid. <clears throat> So it says, the law is not like Rabbi Yehuda. We'll see. Therefore, the mothers, listen to this, the mothers of these Kohanim, they would bring the accidental murderers that were in exile in these cities of refuge. They would bring them food and garments and all sorts of presents. But you have to understand what's happening over there, right? Shmerel killed someone by accident. Now he has to run to Shechem. Shechem was one of the cities of refuge. And he has to stay there for the rest of his life or until the Kohen Gadol passes away. So what's he going to do? He's going to pray every day that the Kohen Gadol should die already. And if you have, let's say, several people that are accidental murderers and they're all in the city, so all of them are praying together. They can make a minion. They can make who knows. And they can say to heal him every, every morning and pray, right, have a big picture of the Kohen Gadol, and pray that he dies. Because as soon as he dies, everyone will go home. Right? So here we learn also the importance of prayer. That God listens to prayers. So it says the mothers of the Kohen Gadols, they would go and give these people, these prisoners that were prisoned because of, the, in exile, whatever you want to call it, in the city, because they killed by accident, they would bring them all sorts of presents and make life good for them. Uh, see, it's good for you when you're staying here in the city of refuge, right? You like it. Don't pray for my son to die. So lo yit palalusa, that they will not pray al benayim on their sons, shemuta, that they'll die. Mish nigmardino. But how does this work? Let's say a person was judged judge that he has to go to the city of refuge and as soon as he's judged the court says I find you Shmerel guilty of accidental murder you have to spend the rest of your life in the city of refuge all of a sudden he hears from outside get your daily paper Cohen Goddle just died he just died right now right oh this is this is what happens Tell me, when did he die? Did he die after the judge said that I'm guilty? Yeah, he died like a minute ago. Fresh news. He says, oh, so if after his judgment, his judgment was passed, the Kohen Gadol died, then he goes home. The man goes home. Im ad nigmardino mate, Kohen Gadol. But if the Kohen Gadol died in the morning, and the judge, one hour after the coin Gadol died, the judge <clears throat> decided, sentenced this person to exile because of accidental murder. So now, Mino Echad Tachtav, they appointed a new Kohen Gadol in the place of the one that died one hour before the sentence was declared. Well, then it 
so if the coin guttle dies first and then after Mikan, afterwards the 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 his sentence is declared that he has to go to the city of refuge, then the first the death of the first coin guttle does not exempt him. Now he has to wait for the second coin guttle, the one after him, until he dies. Let's just go and see the second one here. It's just a little bit of it. Because we're going to learn this. This we're going to have to learn the tomorrow uh, on Sunday. It's a continuing in the same vein. What if his he was sentenced to death? He was sentenced. I'm sorry, sentenced to exile. And the coin guttle. Was, there was no coin guttle. There was no coin guttle at the time. Or what if a person killed the coin guttle? He killed the high priest. What about a Kohen Gadol that he killed someone? So these people never leave the city of refuge. They have to stay there forever, as we will learn, God willing, on Sunday. Thank you all for coming. We will have class tomorrow morning at 8.15. We learn a Sikh of the Rebbe from 8.15 until 9. Usually it's an unusual Sikh of the Rebbe that we can finish in that time, a beautiful idea to accompany you for Shabbat. Have a good day, everyone. Mashiach now, Yechia Melech, and we should uh, all dance together with Mashiach, the Rebbe Melech Mashiach. Now, Mamash. Shalom, Obracha. Shalom. Tomorrow morning, 8.15. Hope to see you all. And next week, also we learn again, or just like today, 8.15 in the morning until uh, n- until 9.30 and then again from 3 o'clock until approximately 4. Shalom.